Welcome back to Active Minds Podcasts with a twist. Tonight is our first ever Active Minds on the Rocks uh, in honor of our buddy Zane here. And Cheers. the whole idea here that we're trying to do is explore and have conversations with people that are inventing new lanes for themselves. We're learning through their experiences, their perspectives, and then we have a little fun. We start to field your questions, your curiosities, as well as ours. And really what the whole goal of this is to see how it pertains and connects to ourselves. And of course, the whole idea here is to move smarter together. So I want to welcome Zane, a.k.a. Bubba. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't That's help his myself. Nickname. I couldn't help myself. Yeah. Uh, but Northeastner, uh, yep. you hustler from a kid. You then went on to scale yourself to different industries. You got out of a dark hole. You took the skills that made you money, and then you got into the solar game. Yep. And then you, I mean, I doubt that that's the only game you're in, but right now, you jokingly said before, some of the people that have been on here before are literally your mentees. Yeah. And the, the topic that I'd love to go with today is the diary of a contrarian. Sure. Because while everyone was zigging, you zagged. And now, you're kind of celebrating in your Ferrari, your Lambo, <laughs> and soon to be rolls. So congratulations, first of all, man. Thank you. God I really appreciate it's a, it's a, that. I really appreciate that. It's a beautiful thing to that. see you doing your thing and to, not only that, man, like it sounds like you're really enjoying yourself, which to me makes this all sound worth it. For sure. For sure. No, I agree, man. And one, very excited to be on this podcast. Yeah, man. I'm the first on The Rocks, so I'm Hell, hoping that this is, uh, yes, you know, On The Rocks continues and it becomes the biggest part of your of your podcast. That's oh, yeah. Goal, oh, dude, man. you're coming back. Yeah. <laughs> I don't oh, know if you know this course, already. Man. Of course, <laughs> man. This is going to be the number two podcast in the world behind my, behind my next one in the future. <laughs> <laughs> I like where this is going. Yeah. I like where this is going. You son of a bitch. I like uh, you, man. Yeah, man. Mm. So, yeah, no, I appreciate it. Excited for today's talk, and I think we're going to get into some awesome stuff. Absolutely, man. So, obviously, uh, when I talk about the Diaries of a Contrarian, so many things come up, like Black Sheep of the Family, you know, the Contrarian itself is funny because it, it comes with the whole anti-hero slash iconoclast sure. thing of it. Yep. And one thing that I love covering here with certain people is, okay, here's what everyone else is doing. Here's what you're doing. And here's why you're seeing different results. But I'm not going to pepper you with the same thing. So that'd be a different podcast, man. For sure. We, that's for the daytime. This yep. is nighttime. So let's shoot the shit for real. Yeah, for sure. First things first. Let's start here. What is the one thing that you were told you're going to fuck up on and you enjoyed? seeing you prove them wrong yeah i would say the biggest thing man is is honestly money um and it's a funny topic because i think a lot of people uh like to steer away from money they like to steer away from confronting it talking about it etc and i think a big reality is it's people's biggest pain point um you know it's something people don't always figure out to make it's some people that something that people wish they knew how to make it's some people wish they had more of so uh, people always will try to give you their opinions on what they think about it due to not being able to figure it out themselves. Mm. So for me, like growing up, I grew up in a very small town called Weymouth, Massachusetts. And it is a place where, you know, I'd say lower middle class is the best way to describe it. Um, a lot of people work in construction, electricians are kind of the higher end of that town and then everyone else, right? So in that place, you know, I just learned from a very young age, you know, having a lot of money is a bad thing. You need to save up all of your money. Every dollar you make is, you know, is is very important to just keep and hold on to. A penny saved is a penny earned. You know, you hear all these sayings growing up. And then, you know, you have my mom growing up. I remember like getting food stamps, getting vouchers, clipping coupons and, you know, all of that stuff. My dad, you know, literally every dollar he made, like pulling it out in cash, counting it at night, like, you know, like caring about money so much in that way. But then on the flip side, telling me a bunch of false beliefs about money, like, hey, you have to work for someone. You have to go to college. You have to get a degree. And my entire life, I always told people I'm going to be you know, the wealthiest person, you know, but I'm not going to go work for someone. I'm not going to be a doctor. I'm not going to be a lawyer and I'm not going to be an engineer. And growing up in a Middle Eastern family, you know, that's what's pushed so, so heavily. I'm sure, you know, yeah. but it's, it's the number one thing. It's like two things. It's, you know, are you going to college and what are you going to be? And then are you going to get married at some point? And it's like those two things. And that's like <laughs> the thesis of your entire You're life. You're 21. Where's the wife? Yeah, exactly. Um, it's funny. So specifically that, um, yeah, I'm a little biased <laughs> Yeah, because I did grow up, uh, you know, in a, in a Latino Middle Eastern family 
you know so it was literally just work 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 yep. with a rihanna song <laughs> yeah work, 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 work. Yep. but it's funny because it's uh, okay so you said your family says save the money yep but having money brings problems yes so it almost feels like your finish line is just more money more problems exactly that's a weird conundrum to be in dude in your shoes i just think people don't understand money so um especially when they haven't made it before so to yeah. them it's like yeah like you want to save all of your money but money is also not important it's not everything it's not this and at a young age you know i did very poorly in school mm -hmm. i was never successful at school i never had over a 3.0 gpa or anything like that always in the low twos for gpas always failing my classes almost held back most of the years i was in school mm -hmm. labeled you know uh adhd add you know every type of dd i was labeled <laughs> uh and you know everything in my life has always been that so i've always been that like you said the black sheep and then when i would go to you know family events it's like oh x person made honor roll this person made this Aww. you know this person's doing this and it's like everyone knew i was the you know i was the quote unquote like dumbest kid in the in the family group yeah. But I was always the one that was a little bit different. You know, I wasn't very liked. Yeah. I always created problems. I always went against, you know, kind of the grain. And um, my whole life, it was very weird because I like, I had this like belief that was just like super, um, I guess you could say, uh, uh, it, it was a very big belief. It was like a very confident, strong belief in myself almost to the point where people might call it delusional. There was no reasoning or logic behind it, but no, I had felt this that thing. thing right here. I just knew it, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, I knew it. But of course, as you're growing up, there's always gonna be a little piece of you that's like, what if everyone else is right? But for me, I was very lucky that it was a very, you know, let's say it was 10% what other people mm -hmm. thought and 90% what I believed in. So that obviously heavily weighed against all of that negativity. Um, but I always tell people like, negativity is way stronger than positivity. So I needed that to be 90-10. If it was 50-50, I would have been fucked, you know? But I needed it to be 90-10, where I had 90% belief in myself, 10% a little doubt because what, if other you know, what other people were saying. And then as I got older, um, that belief got very, you know, got a lot stronger because I learned more about myself. And don't get me wrong, I did the wrong things. You know, age 14, I was stealing bikes and stealing headphones and reselling them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Damn, age talk about a markup, dude. Yeah, it's yeah. free. <laughs> free. And then, yeah, you, you know, I, I remember I'd get these Skull Candy headphones exactly, steal them from the store in the mall, put like 50 of them in my backpack, like literally clear out the shelf, Holy shit, roll out sell them each for like 25 bucks, you know, and I was pumped, right? Because I could make money. And then 14, I got into smoking weed. Um, 15, I got into selling weed. Uh, then I got into the all, you know, all the other drugs. Yeah. And then when I was 16 years old, my mom had a massive stroke um, oh, wow. that caused her to go into a coma I condolences, dude. for, you know, over a year. Uh, and then, you know, she, she's, she's good now, but you know, it was basically for the next three to four years of my life, it was different because, you know, basically from 16 to 20, because, you know, I'm dealing with someone I love a lot, number one. Number two, the, the survival problem was, you know, she was, you know, almost half of the income of the household. So losing that Shit, completely, that wiped out. yeah, wiped out. My dad, who's, you know, also the other half, is now having to go to the hospital every day, which eats up in his work. So now that also affects income. And I'm failing all my classes, getting in trouble, um, parents, you know, found drugs on me and stuff. So they know that's going on. So it's a, it's a little bit of everything going on at the same time. And I'm just trying to figure myself out, but I still have this belief that I can do it. So at that, like, you know, pretty young age, 17 to 18, I kind of stopped all the bad stuff, put it away. I'm almost lucky that I did it at such a young age mm -hmm. because I got it out of my system. And then at 18, um, I was like, what do I want to do? Like, I want to be successful. I've worked jobs. I've worked in restaurants. I've worked in stores at this point. Um, I've done network marketing, which, you know, I made a decent amount of money in actually because I was good at selling. Mm -hmm. um, and then at 18, I'm like, I got to figure my life out. My mom's coming out of a coma. She's coming back to like reality. Mm -hmm. And her biggest goal in life is for me to go to college and graduate. So I'm like, let me make her happy. Not because I want to go, but because she wants me to. I get into some state school, like nothing special, um, purely a party school. I go and I party for a little over a year. Um, while partying, I get back into selling drugs. I get back into doing stuff. The customer's right there. Yeah, you know, I had a full life cycle. Like I'd make money sending people to a bar and a club. I'd make money sending people to an event. 
I'd make money, you know, putting people in a house, doing a little side real estate deals. Mm -hmm. And then I made money selling them drugs. So I had my little ecosystem. And then after a year of doing that, I was like, this is cool. Cause I've made a lot of money being yeah. a college student. I made almost six figures a year, over six figures a year actually, um, while being in college at 18 years old, selling all the wrong things and doing all the wrong things, but making money nonetheless. Um, and then uh, I just had a big like life check. I was like, I'm either gonna do this for the rest of my life and hustle and never make a crazy amount of money, but always hustle and do stuff that maybe I'm not proud of, mm -hmm. or I'm gonna go and I'm gonna change the course of my life. So hmm. I left everything. I left every drug, everything I did, every party. Um, and I had a friend that was selling in the solar industry. And I was like, I'm gonna go all into the solar industry. Like randomly, really? I was just like, I'm gonna give everything up. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna look into this thing. I go on YouTube. I search the solar industry. I see a video with Warren Buffett and he says, quote for uh, uh, word for word, he goes, the largest transfer of wealth in history is going to be in the deregulation of energy. And we are very heavily invested in renewable energies and solar. So I was like, boom, like Warren says this. Yeah. Like this is a guy that is going to be the largest transfer of wealth in history. Yeah. I'm like, that's crazy. So. I go all in, I get a job door to door selling solar. I work at a startup for a few months. Then I get recruited to Solar City, which was Tesla essentially, um, owned by Elon Musk's cousin. He was the CEO and Elon was the board member. And then they sold it to Tesla to make it official. Um, so I worked there, juggernaut of a company, huge, you know, thousands of people working there, um, became one of the top salespeople very quickly. Um, my first year there was on pace to make, you know, over half a million bucks a year selling door to door So you brought your skills from high school with you everything just selling always hustling selling like i realized yeah, yeah, yeah. i'm always knocking a door no matter what i do from you know when i started to today were you always like that like you could just talk to anybody yeah because you know i was always very confident very bold and willing to take no for an answer because my whole life was no you know my whole life was you suck you're this you're that you, what you, do you gotta lose? so yeah you're like dude i'm i'm making more than my parents have ever made by 10 X 20 X. Yeah. Like, of course I'm going to be confident. Right. <laughs> um, oh yeah. Oh, so yeah. I do that for a bit. I meet like the best people in the industry. I meet, you know, some of the C level people in the company too. And then, um, I get an offer from a guy who started a solar company and he sold his portion of it because he had a problem with some of the owners. That company today is actually one of the largest in the space, top 10. And, uh, he sold it. And he was like, Zane, I want you to come. I'm starting a company and I want you to help me with sales and marketing because I know the install side. I know the, you know, the finance connections, the technology. I need you on this side. So I say, OK, I got nothing to lose. I was about to get promoted to a position there where the current guy in the position was making over a million dollars a year, director of sales. So oh, nice. I'm 20 years old. About to make a million. About to make a million. And I leave that to go start something from scratch with no salary, all commission based. And not only that, that's was, exciting though. Yeah, it was for me, right? But yeah, like to most fucking, people, they're like, what are you doing? You what know, what am I not doing? Are you kidding yeah. me? Sky's the limit for you. Yeah. So I have that happen. I make the decision. I'm doing this. I, like, it, honestly, for me, it didn't even register that I wasn't going to do it because I was like, listen, yeah, there's all this downside, but my whole life, I've never been someone that ever looked at the downside. I always looked at the upside even foolishly sometimes. Yeah. Um, so I was like, okay, let's do it. Uh, so the other crazy part about it was I hadn't traveled a lot at this point in my life. I had been to some other countries with my family, but haven't really traveled around the United States that much. And I was doing most of this out of Boston. And uh, my family basically decided, uh, you know, they wanted to stay there, et cetera, our whole lives. And we never left. And when this guy wanted to start this company, he's like, hey, I want to go to California and we're doing this there. So I've never been to California at that point. Uh, barely traveled outside of the state of Massachusetts. Um, and now I was going to go move my whole life to a place where I knew no one. I had zero friends and I had never been to before. That sounds exciting, dude. Yeah. So we did it. I drove across the country in my car. Um, I brought t two of my friends along. And I was like, I don't care what you're doing. You're coming with me. We're doing this thing. You guys are going to come and sell. Yeah. And then I brought a few more of them like a month later. I probably had like five or six friends start with me, of which I think only 
two of them are still with me till today. <laughs> um, we build this company. Kudos up. to them for sticking it out, man. For sure. And we just start knocking doors in California at a place we've never been before, but selling solar. Yeah. Our first year, we crushed it. We did 24 million in sales. Um, and we kept growing and blowing Fuck. up. Ew. I made good money. Yes. Uh, then we went, you know, year two, year three. And then about my third year into the company, um, there's this guy who founded the company. He was the main owner. And uh, he basically was happy with the results, but was taking all of the money and making the wrong decisions, I thought. You know, mm. he wanted to hire all these people. He wanted to build a software. You know, we had about 100 W2 employees at the time. So you know, we're hiring all these people, which is cool if you're putting it in the right places, but he was putting it in places where action wasn't being taken. And my title became the chief revenue officer. He was the CEO. And uh, our beliefs were just completely separate. He was like, I don't want to pay salespeople a lot. I want to charge the customer the highest product, the highest price, and I don't want to give the most premium product. So he was like, I'm not going to pay the salespeople a lot. I'm going to charge the highest Sounds price. Sounds like a 99 cent store owner. Exactly. Yeah, it was like <laughs> nine, 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 it was the 99 cent store with the most expensive price, yeah. you know, charging designer this guy's prices, in long business. and then trying to make a lot of margin all while trying to build things that never got finished. So we're just going in the wrong direction at this point. We're getting big, but we're going in the wrong direction. And at that point, I had just have people in the company come up to me and they go like, we look at you as the CEO of this company. Like you're the true person here. And we just want to let you know, like we're only here because of you. If you weren't here, we wouldn't be here. So I started thinking like, what do I do? What do I do? I just kind of put it to the side and forgot about it. And was like, I'm going to stay loyal. I'm going to keep doing this thing. And then it got to a point where I had a few people be like, listen, dude, you're going to go make a move and do this on your own or we're leaving. Like they you, pushed you. Yeah. Like they almost pushed me into it. I said, you know what? I can't take more of this. So long story short, I ended up going to launch a company. Yeah. This was three years and one month ago. And, um, you know, we started, uh, you know, basically used founder cash. So like we didn't raise any money. We didn't get any investors. Uh, our first month in business, we did really well. We hired a lot of people. I brought on, you know, all these salespeople, et cetera. So we had over a hundred sales contractors, about 10 W2 employees at that time when we started day one. Um, and we just started, which most businesses in solar are, we started as a sales organization, mm -hmm. meaning we sold everything. We brought the contracts someone else and someone fulfilled. else fulfilled it. And that's very normal in our industry, right? You have two types of companies, you have fulfillers and you have sellers. So um, we did that. Mm -hmm. We became very big, probably top 10 at that in the nation at that time. In an area where no one knew you. In an area where no one knew me at the time. Um, we did that in like a few months, like in a very few, in a few months, we became top 10 sales companies in solar and then, uh, started making some money. We acquired a installer that was doing the fulfillment side. So we bought them out, nice. brought them in, merged both companies together, uh, became one big organization. And today we are, uh, you know, one of the top solar companies in the United States, um, on the top 20 list of solar companies, there's 50,000 residential solar companies. On the top 20 list, the average age of the company is about 10 years old. Mm -hmm. The next newest company to us is about seven years old, and we are three years old. So we've done that in a very short period of time relative to everyone else. And today we do about 1,200 homes a month. We do everything from sell wow. to fulfill. Um, we have over 2000 sales contractors that sell through us. We have over 45 companies that fulfill through us. Um, we have over 400 W2 employees. We hire anywhere from 40 to 50 every single month W2 into the company. Mm -hmm. um, we have, I think it's eight, eight different office locations at this point. Um, we cover all of California. We cover Arizona and we cover Florida. And uh, very soon here, we're opening up Texas as well. Mm. Um, and yeah, we're just scaling really fast this year. We'll do probably over 200 million. Um, but we are running at a run rate where next year we'll do probably, you know, high nine figures to potentially cross a billion. And, uh, we've done that in a short time. And a big part of it is just, I love what we do. I love our industry. I love our product. It's such a win, win, win for everybody involved. And I have a unbelievable team, like a stellar team that just 
through my years of working in the industry, I picked this person, that person, that person, and that person, and just brought everyone together. And I was like, listen, like, you know, I know every single one of you could probably go and start your own company and do your own thing, but come together be a part of this bigger vision and i promise you it's going to be a payoff and i got a lot of people like that at the beginning that you know are here till today and absolutely are very happy with their decision um and then started just utilizing social media to meet a lot of people and bring in the best talent so today you know like i told you we recruit um 40 to 50 w2 you know salaried employees every month um and then we recruit over 250 salespeople every single month something that stands out to me is as I listen to you, I, what I'm extrapolating, getting from what you're saying, is the win-win-win sticks out to me. Because that is that is your core. That's your belief system. It's the only reason I can do it, actually, and I'm good at it. Like, yeah. I, I'll, I'll tell you a story. A very, very big prominent figure. I'm not going to say his name. Um, just because I like him. He's an unbelievable guy. Um, but he wanted me to be a part of an organization um, that he ran. Mm-hmm. He has over 80,000 people that work with him. He's a bit, you know, probably close to a billionaire at this point. Very well known online. If I say his name, you'll know him. And um, he wanted me to kind of work with him and be a little bit of a mini me and be a part of that. And I had an opportunity to make a lot of money. And I couldn't even get myself up to do it because I was so uninspired and unfulfilled. Like today, if if I don't feel it's an unbelievable product, if I don't feel the customer is winning at another level, if I don't feel the sales rep is making a lot of money, and if I don't feel that the employees are happy, there's no way that I can do it. Like I can't sacrifice those things. Well, that's probably why, correct me if I'm wrong, that's why you're successful in not only recruiting, but developing intrapreneurs. Mm -hmm. You know, because you just said, uh, I have these four or five people that can build their own thing. But if they join me on this thing. I have thing, a lot of people, dude. I have, yeah. I have, because I have salespeople too mm -hmm. that can actually go and build their own sales companies today. You know, I have salespeople make two, three million dollars a year working with me. Mm -hmm. So we pay out very well. Um, but, you know, they know the vision is so much greater than that. Like, I'm not someone that's like, hey, I'm happy where we're at. I'm not going to be happy at a billion. I'm not going to be happy at 10. I'm not going to be happy at 100. Like, to me, this is a never ending game. Mm -hmm. that I will do for the rest of my life because I believe in it so much. And I believe I will be doing something that is against my duty and my purpose if I ever stop. Well, the average person is going to hear you and your passion for solar and probably wonder out loud, what the fuck? When did I miss this train? For sure. Okay, but why is everyone missing the train on solar? One, I don't think a lot of people are. Like, the amount of people that are getting into the industry is insane at this point. It's growing. Like, if you look at the growth curve, mm -hmm. it's like this. The U.S. government, so we have a federal tax credit that all of our customers mm -hmm. get. It was 30% before, meaning if they buy a $30,000 system, 9000 comes back from the government. Mm -hmm. It w stepped down at 26%, and then the next year or two, it was going to go away to zero. And they just extended it to back up to 30% for the next 10 years. So we are- So they're on, encouraging it. Oh yeah, they're putting an insane amount of money into it. Um, our product is so good for our customer because everything is financed. Mm. Um, we have a 25 year loan. These loans are at you know anywhere from 1.49 to 299 interest rates. So wow. extremely low. Very, very um, low, yeah. Over 25 years too, we're not talking So what is the years. monthly payment, like 100 uh, bucks? So it depends how big your system is. You know, we yeah. have $15,000 systems, we have $120,000 systems, right? It's based on how much electricity you use in your Fair. home. Yeah. We design you your system based on that. We wanna give you 100% of your power that year through your system and for the next 25 years. We maintain and warranty it for the entire 25 years. If you need a new roof, we roll that into the system um, and we'll do it for you. And let's say in California, for example, you're paying $300 a month for power. Mm -hmm. Your monthly payment on that loan is probably gonna be 220 to 230 day one. Now that 220 to 230, it's a loan, so it's locked in for life. That $300 over the last 100 years, it has never gone down. Yeah, that's what I mean, like, eh, it's always only, gonna only go going up. up. It will never not go up. In fact, 
with inflation, with anything going on, no matter what happens, that payment will always go up. You better be careful and in Texas, dude. You're and gonna piss off a lot of people. Yeah, but it's <laughs> it's all good, man. You know, I'm I'm cool with pissing off people. Like, uh, it's it's just the truth. Yeah. Like, a lot of places that payment has gone up 20, 30, 40 percent in one year. So not only are we locking them in today at a savings, when they're paying zero out of pocket, but now in the future, as those payments go up with the utility their cost savings just continues to drive up because their payment stays like this while the utility payment goes like this. True. So um, it's just a great product, man. And then we also help the environment on top of it. And then whether you're left, right, this or that, you know, whether you believe in climate change or not, just when you look at solar, you have basically two options right now. Either you can pull from the grid and your power is gonna come from 50 to 100 miles away and it's going to come underground or through those big poles and wires you see just in the transfer of that you're going to lose 15 to 20 percent of the power naturally so it's mm. inefficient number one number two that power is pulled from the ground you know just fracking you know it's, you're just getting oil like no matter what anyone says that's proven to be a scarce resource right it's not forever sure. versus cutting that entire inefficient system out and you have a solar system on your roof that is now beautiful a lot of people think of these old looking solar systems now they are super thin they're one or two inches off your roof like this they're black on black they look unbelievable on your home um and that's getting you 100 percent of your po your power and you're not relying on the grid if you need the grid like you use extra power that month you're still connected so it's always going to pull but if you produce your solar system produces more that month it's going to go back to your grid it's going to send it to your neighbors and you're going to get a credit for it. Yeah, sell it back. Yeah. And um, all that entire system I just explained, you're not paying any money for. Now let's flip it to the company side. Your sales rep can make anywhere from, you know, uh, two to $3,000 in the low end to twenty dollars to $30,000 in the high end on that system uh, as a commission. They're providing a good service to their customer. True. And their sales cycle in the home is... 45 minutes to an hour they're not you know in this three four month long sales cycle we install it you know usually three to four weeks from when they sign the contract just because of permitting the install takes six hours uh so now the customer's happy the person selling it happy it creates an insane amount of jobs throughout the entire process that's very true and that so there's a lot of people getting paid in their families and then the company's happy because we're profitable. And we've, you know, my entire business has been built on cash flow, zero investors. We've been profitable from the beginning and we've always grown through cash flow. So that whole process, man, it's like, I have never ever seen, and of course I'm biased, but I've never seen an industry like that. And I truly believe we are at the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not only that I believe, I know like, you know, we've touched a few percent of the market share throughout the United States alone, let alone the entire planet. So that's how I kind of think. And uh, it's my, it's kind of my life mission. Speaking of life mission, um, your core beliefs and fundamentals seem to basically guide everything you do. Like the minute you said win, 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 I've, I've only met a, a select type of person who believes in that. Yeah. Uh, and they, it, I don't think it's a coincidence. They're all doing well. Yeah. Um, but if you don't mind, I'd love to hear more of that because it's something that you carry with you from here on out, one. Yeah. But number two, it's a knee-jerk reaction for you. It's a habit for you now. Yeah. What well, First, I'd love to explore how'd you get there. And number two, why do you think that the average person is just not open to the win-win-win? Yeah. Like they might pretend they are, but they're not. Um, It's a great question, number one. Uh. I truly believe like life is a game. Um, it's been a game from the beginning and you're playing in a game. And I am someone, uh, I am very, very, very all into the things I believe in and very, very all out into the things I don't believe in, right? I'm never in between. And uh, a lot of that I believe stems from growing up in a environment of fear where everyone was always scared. My mom was scared, my dad was scared, worried about the light bill, worried about the water bill, worried about where we're gonna live, worried about the next you know, meal, worried about this and that, and you know, what happens to the economy, who's the president, you know, always just worried. Li you know, living in fear and making an excuse for almost everything. And I love all of these people, of course. I love my parents to death. They're the nicest, best people I've ever met. Like they're so caring and good people. 
Um, but they just grew up like that. And, you know, that was the way they were framed mentally. And for me, um, I've always been a massive risk taker. Like I said, all in, all out. And I'm very like not conservative in that sense. When I believe in something, I'm willing to risk it all. I always joke like, you know, if, if I have a hundred million dollars, let's say in a bank account, and there's an idea that I really believe in, that's going to cost me exactly $100 million. I will invest it without a doubt because Mm -hmm. I just believe in it so much, but I believe people, no matter what they say, they have so much fear and they never go all into what they have. So for me, it's always been like, I I've always been generous. I've always been willing to give. I've always been willing to help people actually, you know, a a cool little quick story happened today. Actually. I don't know. Do you know Adam Weitzman? Shout out to Adam Weitzman, by the way, follow this guy. If you don't follow him, I'll check him out beast. Uh, so Adam's a billionaire. Um, he's a neighbor of mine here and, uh, you know, Adam, I started following a little while ago on Instagram and, uh, this is a very fresh story, so it's kind of cool to tell it, but, uh, you know, I've always seen him around, right. You know, he's always with every celebrity, you know, around with, you know, Jake Paul to little Dirk to all these rappers. And, you know, they always shout him out like, you know, he's the best guy, Adam, Adam, Adam. Right. So, you know, we just had a few mutual friends and, you know, exchange each other's info on Instagram. And uh, this morning, uh, he's like, yeah, dude, like, uh, you're my neighbor, like, uh, come over for coffee. And it's the first time we've ever met in person. So I go to his new house here and he's, you know, he lives all over, but uh, he just gets this like $23 million, it's 17,000 square foot condo penthouse. Um, so we're visiting there, we're talking, you know, he's asking me about me and my life and he's telling me about his life. You know, he's built a massive company. It's a recycling company, one of the biggest in, in the US. And um, he's just a very like abundant guy. And we're talking about watches. I'm very big into watches. You know, I have APs, Richard Mills, Patex, you know, all these watches and we're talking and he's like, oh, you like APs? He's like, check out this one. So he shows me this one right here. And he's like, yeah, man, check it out. And he's like, oh, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's super cool. He's like, hey, keep it. It's a $200,000 watch. Yeah. He's like, hey, keep it. I'm like, what you, we just met. Like, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And this is a different type of coffee we're having. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man. And, That's you know, it. like, because I understand him, I'm not going to fight it back. I'm like, dude, I, I understand you because I would do the same thing. Yeah. And that's why that guy is so successful. He could do it another way. And there's people probably at that level that aren't that generous. That's true. Yeah. But his life keeps paying dividends and he keeps growing and he keeps reaching a new level. So and it's all abundance to that. To him, yeah. His so perspective. F- for me, it's like, you know, I have a, I have a friend, a very, very, very good friend, actually. And um, as I was telling you, I just bought this car. I just bought this new Rolls Royce Cullinan. You know, it's a half a million dollar car. Yeah. So he's like, uh, he was texting me about it. I was like, oh yeah, man. I know I was pumped when I got it. I, I sent him a text. He's one of my best friends. And he goes, uh, dude, half a million dollars? That's a lot for a car. And I responded, pennies. And he's like, no, it's not pennies. And I love him to death. But my mission is to get people to stop that. Yeah. Because I scarcity. believe that is not the way you need to think man like dude if i if i lose everything i have today it's all good because there is one thing that is more powerful than all of that stuff and it's my spiritual being it's my spiritual unit and it's this thing that i believe is worth you know it's not worth a million dollars a hundred million or billion. this thing is in you know it's it's priceless and this unit is what has created all of this in my life And as long as I have this unit and my cognitive function is there and I am healthy, I will be able to create an infinite amount of success, you know, wealth and, you know, anything I ever want in this planet, in this world. I'm so happy to hear that, man. Um, We we have a lot of parallels, by the way. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, We have a lot of parallels. Uh, And one thing that I was bringing up earlier was just like mental models. And specifically, like, what I love about your perspective, I'm biased as fuck, by the way, because I, I share in your belief. Um, very often I get referred to as hippie and so on. But specifically, the thing is just that there's, like, this, like, you don't know how to describe it, but you just know. And when you just know, you know, you look at the people around you, and it's okay if they see life a certain way. Uh, I was talking to someone earlier about this when it came to, like, they were talking about like, oh, like if I get more money, that means I get more attention. That means I'm going to be scrutinized more. That means I'm going to have to answer more questions, blah, blah, blah. And I asked them, what did your parents, 
associate with money. Like, I love seeing, I personally get a kick out of seeing people say like, oh, that's a lot of money for a car, or you could have used it in a different way. But yeah. but that's not your business. And like you're doing with your money as you see fit, one. And number two, you can have that because you already made the money. Yeah. So you're qualified to have a say in where the fuck the money goes. Yeah, and you know, people will tell me, all I run a solar company, right? Yeah. Environmental friendly but i also have a bunch of gas guzzling cars <laughs> balance fly on private jets balance. you know i, I yeah. actually just just went on a, a really big jet to to europe and i'm gonna see I, you then when i get flying I'm yeah i'm getting my civilian pilot license there we go hell yeah. yeah man um and i started getting all these comments like how ironic like you know owner of a solar company like on a plane like blah 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 blah, blah like all this bs the fuck are you supposed to do with your money and i respond back just you know i actually don't respond back but uh, uh <laughs> in your head though here, here's my response back for all of you uh oh shit you know whoa 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 wait wait if you're watching this and enjoying it press pause for a second go to active mindsclub.com again active mindsclub.com here you will have membership access to our exclusive networking events as well as behind the scene access to our guests where you yourself can ask them questions. Not to mention, at these events and in the community, you're gonna have access to the very mentors that are here sitting with us as well as many, many more that are doing cool things in stocks, marketing, cars, real estate, where we're going to have you have access to education, insights, how-tos, all things that you can apply to your life and business. I help 1,200 families a month go solar. Um, I'm a part of a foundation that uh, almost every quarter goes to different countries and builds solar systems, uh, you know, water filtration systems, et cetera, across the world. I donate lots of money. Um, I help our carbon offset overall for those of you into climate change more than you know 99.9999999 percent of people um if i get on a plane or i drive a car one it's because i enjoy it but two it's because there's a reason mm -hmm. like when i go on a plane it's because i have the luxury of not wanting to go through an airport and not wanting to go through tsa and saving hours of my time because yeah. those hours of my time are very valuable because the more time i have the more things i can do with it so um you know, for me, man, it's it's like my whole life is based on that. It's what's your net impact and effect on the world. And, you know, mm. I don't want to sound cocky, but that's the one, you know, like the net impact. I do so much for so many people. It's OK for me to live it. Dude, come on, man. Yeah. That that right there is fuck. I should just change the topic of this yeah. conversation. But the net impact, like I, very frequently. So the moral soapbox, right? Yeah, it's getting crowded and I keep very much like you just said like you have people like having these opinions and their opinion is is warranted that's their perspective of life but specifically the whole dude i'm gonna get in trouble for this the whole virtue signaling of it is interesting because they're like oh zane you could do this you could do that and that's fine that's their opinion but let's face the reality of it when you're doing certain things your way there's a reason why you're being compensated a little differently than that person. Yeah. And then you also have the reality check of one, f facing life the way it is, not the way you want it to be. And then there's this very funny thing where, you ever you ever heard of Shel Silverstein? He's a poet? No. Shel, uh, Shel Silverstein is a poet back in the day. And there's a poem that just came to mind, the coulda, woulda, shouldas. And long story short, I'm butchering. I'm not even gonna bother to fuck it up. But basically it was like, the coulda, woulda, shouldas all have this things to say, blah, blah. And they all ran away from the one who did. Got it. And when I hear what you're saying, that's what I, I literally think back to that poem mm -hmm. because you're like, dude, like, look at all the stuff that I'm accomplishing. Look at all the stuff that I'm contributing. And, and I don't say it to like rub in anyone's face. It's not face, rubbing it in the face, but, like, bro. Like you're enjoying you, you your all, success. All of you, every single one of you, I don't care what you say. They would do it too. You are at the same advantage that I am at. Yes. No matter what you want to say. You want to say, oh, I grew up here. I grew up here. Great. So I did grow we. up with shit, right? And of course, there's people that grew up worse than me with less opportunity. There's people that grew up with a lot more than me. At the end of the day, it's not about like where we start, right? It's about what we do in our life and accomplish. The net, the net impact. The, the net impact. Yeah. And for me, man, it's like, I'm with you. If I sat here all day long and I created money and, you know, let's say my business was, uh, and 
nothing against this, by the way, because I still believe that you have a positive impact in whatever company you do. But let's say, you know, actually, you know, I'm going to take it even, I was going to say alcohol, but Go I'm going to take it worse. <laughs> I'm going to take it to something that doesn't help anyone. You know, let's say I sold heroin all day. God I made a damn. ton of money, but I sold, I sold a ton <laughs> Holy of heroin. Shit. Right? What? You know, uh, because I, I was going to say alcohol, but then I was like, yeah, but think about all the people in employees. So it helps some people, right? <laughs> oh, shit. Um, but like, mm. you know, let's go to, let's go to heroin. Let's go to like the darkest side. That's right? pretty dark. Yeah. It's very, very dark. Right. Or I'm a human trafficker or something. Yeah. Right. I'm very dark. Um, uh, I'd be making a lot of money, but I would have zero net impact. I'd have negative net impact. I probably killed people on this planet, yeah. on planet earth. And I'm a very big believer. I'm a very big, like, you know, um, I, I want to have a lot of kids, right? Like, mm -hmm. like as I get older, I don't All know. Right, any Elon. Kids. Yeah. No, I'm no, but it's true. <laughs> like, dude, I, uh, my, you know, I, I have people around always ask me like, how many kids you want to have. I'm like, dude, if, 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 many. if, if I could have 50, I have 50. If I could have a hundred, I have a hundred. Yeah, man. Because. I'm financially capable. Of okay, it. no, seriously, you'd have fifty kids. As many as I can possibly have is the goal. Holy fuck, fifty kids! Because to me, man, like life is so beautiful. Um, people are amazing, and if we want to keep growing as a society, we mm -hmm. need more amazing people. And Fair. Okay. you know, yeah, uh, makes sense. Instead of all of these things in our world that kill people and take people out and whatnot, it's like, let's replace that with positivity and let's put more people into the world. So pe people call me crazy. Like when, pe when I say it, I genuinely believe people think I'm trolling or joking when I, I say it 100% confidently. Yeah. Like, dude, if I can have 50, like I'll have 50. You know, if I, if, if, if I can figure out how to do that and it makes sense, like I'll do it because I want to set an example for the people around us. Like it's good to have kids. It's good to have kids in the world. It's good to have more new people because the minute we stop that is, you know, just like anything in business, for example, if you stop revenue, what happens? Your business starts dying slowly, right? Ah. Same thing with the world. So like you, you stop making game. people. That's how I think of it, right? I'm not, I'm not trying to just have 50 kids to have 50 kids to say, I have you think that's kids. what Nick Cannon is doing right now? I don't know if he's thinking that <laughs> way, but hey, anyone, anyone that has a lot of kids, I respect and I support. And I think, whether it's intentional or not, you have a, you're, you're helping. Um, so kind of going back to the heroin analogy, it's like, you know, if I was doing that and going on doing all this stuff, sure. But you know, I'm creating jobs, I'm hiring people, I'm helping planet earth with what I do. I'm creating opportunity. I'm helping our economy. Like I'm doing a lot of things. I don't care who you are. You tell me not to go on a jet, it does not affect me. Exactly. You tell me not to buy a car, it does not affect me. You tell me not to live where I live, it does not affect me because I know what I'm doing and I don't need anyone else's validation. Well, that's that's why I brought up what I brought up before in terms of the perspective of people and let, let's go where it go, really goes, is self-sabotage. Yeah. You know, people have their preconceived notions of things. So while you just said, I know what I know, I know what I want, they're basing it off of, well, my uncle's brother, sister's neighbor's dog's best friend told me that flying jets is bad yeah. <laughs> for the environment. Um, and then they, there's this reliance on confirmation bias. And look, I get it. I get it. But let's face the reality. The average corporation is doing more harm than you are flying in a G6. Sure. But, you know, e even that, man, like... You know, your average corporation still is helping a lot of people, I think. You know, it's Fair, like yeah. you'd be shocked at how much you help the economy. You know, like people always say this about Jeff Bezos, for example. Oh, he doesn't Why do they hate that guy? Taxes, he doesn't do this. I'm like, guys, this guy employs a million people. Let's say the average household had three people. That's three million people, over a million people. Why do they hate him and not Elon? planet Earth creating you know people do hate elon too right like, really it's you know on i mean more media, elon like fanboys i mean it's a lot more trendier online for yeah. sure to like elon but he's also very hated in a lot of ways too by a lot of people that you know um but but in both cases man it's like the net impact is so big D you know i i i saw an article about about bezos he, he bought a yacht and he paid like a crazy <laughs> amount of money to like move this historical <laughs> bridge just so that he got that's why i started laughing through. yeah and people I'm were like, like rallying against him for that let him do it let him do it look at how many people he's helping yeah like i would like everyone to contribute to the economy mm -hmm. because if everyone was jeff bezos holy crap where would planet earth be right like we'd be at another level at this point you know mm -hmm. problems wouldn't exist that 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 exist today but unfortunately and I, I truly believe you know people get in the cycle to 
bring other people down and bring down other people's aspirations and goals or even accomplishments because they truly feel insecure and they truly feel like there's no way that they can do it. So the only way to feel like they got something out of it is to attack. And I always tell people like criticism is okay as long as it has a solution attached to it. Boom. If I criticize you, I better give you a solution. And there you go. And that's why I talked about the moral soapbox. Yeah. Because it's really, yeah, dude, it's so easy to be like, just to talk shit about somebody. You know, it really is. And then when you look at the net impact of the people that they're criticizing, it's like, mm. like I saw the other day, like I, 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 it's the first time I came across it. Maybe you've seen it before. I didn't realize there was a whole fan club of people who hated Oprah. And I was like, wait, really? People hate Oprah? And they're like, oh, yeah, because the school. And they started coming up with these little, little things. And I'm like, come on, man. Seriously? Like, and that's the fucked up part about self-sabotage is that misery no longer enjoys company. It insists on it. Mm -hmm. So when you have these people making these comments to you, it sounds fucked up to say out loud. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that frequently you look at the person and look at the source of the message. So you're listening twice. You're listening to who's saying it and what they're saying. And very frequently, I'm pretty sure you're coming across people that are probably getting in their own way, self-sabotaging themselves, et cetera. And those are the people that have the hot, the loudest microphones to yeah. talk shit about what you're doing. Dude, so, you know, I, I actually believe that 99% of planet Earth is good. Maybe 98%. I believe 1% to 2% is bad. Um, like, truly bad people. Mm -hmm. Like, bad intentions, malicious. Like, they genuinely want to hurt and harm people. Mm. I believe 98 to 99% of people are actually great human beings. Um, I just believe that, especially, you know, today with the internet and the amount of information that's online, there's a lot of false information out there, a lot of it. And there are so many sources of information that people hear and listen to so many different things. You know, they hear this guy say this thing, they hear this guy say this thing, they hear this girl say this thing, they watch the news and they hear this thing and they don't know what to believe or think. So at the end of the day, their only opinions are created through what other people think. And they've heard so many conflicting pieces of information that they don't know what to believe. So that's where their belief system is created. When in reality, um, it's very, very foolish to do that. To listen, you know, to read 100 books by 100 different authors, to watch 100 videos by 100 different people, you are now going to have a hundred pieces of information that are all conflicting in some way or different in some way. How are you going to make a decision? People can't make mm. one decision in their life, Analysis let alone paralysis. all of this stuff. So they come up with stuff that like, you know, they're going to tell one person, one thing and another person, another thing. And at the end of the day, everyone is trying to sell you their way of thinking. Everyone believes that they're right. So what I think I did at an early age, was I stopped listening to 99.9% .9 of what I saw. And I just started going after people that genuinely had what I wanted. Mm. And um, I removed most of the sources of information. And I just got it down to a few. Do you read a lot? Um, it's a good question. I do. But uh, not many sources, if that makes sense. Like, I'm no, not but you brought up something that's very interesting about when it comes to the, your, your, what piques your interest. So you tuned out the noise and you focus on those that were where you wanted to go. Sure. And exactly. when it comes to reading, I've met many people that say, oh, I, I hate reading. I'm not good at reading, just like meditation. But specifically, what, what turns you into a great reader is reading things that interest you. So if so I want to learn, like, I don't know, metalsmithing tomorrow, I'm all of a sudden a great reader because I'm if reading metalsmith. Love it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, Iron Smith. it's, I don't know why I said I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this. You will always hate what you don't understand or <laughs> what you don't know how to do. <laughs> oh, that's a um, whole other episode. <laughs> you know, when, when people say they hate reading, you know, I hear big entrepreneurs say this. I, I, I heard, I heard Gary Vee actually say this and nothing against Gary Vee. I think he says a lot of great things. Mm hmm. But the only reason one would hate reading is if they don't understand what they're reading. And um, I can take a book, average book, and give it to your average person and say, read this. And within five to 10 minutes, I will notice their eyes wander off. I will notice them yawn. I will notice them get tired. Mm -hmm. I heard actually <laughs> uh, another person say something, which again, 
I don't disagree with this person in a lot of things, but I didn't, I disagreed with this. He was like, uh, it was a uh, Ty Lopez. He said, read books before you go to sleep because it's easier to sleep. Mm -hmm. Like when you're reading, you'll fall asleep. What? And I started laughing because I'm like, that keeps me up all night. That no, that just means you don't understand what you're reading, so you get tired and you go to sleep. Yeah, right? I can't read a book. Are you yeah. kidding me? It's a four in the morning. Like, oh shit. Yeah. Oh shit. So what I, am, you know, what I, what I really recommend to people is like, you got to learn how to read. So, mm. and, and the reason I say this is because my entire life I thought I hated reading, until about three, four years ago, and I started learning how to read. I started learning, like, damn, like when when I when I read a page. I think I know what the page means. And then I look at it again and I look at it again and I notice four words on there that I don't know the definitions. Who? And then you I did that out. earlier. Yeah. So I, so I whip out a, a definite, a book and I look at the definition and I'm like, holy crap. I thought I knew the definition of this word, but it was completely different. And then when you start doing that over time, your vocabulary becomes bigger. You learn a lot more. And then you start reading and that same page that you read that could have given you no value and you didn't feel anything out mm. of it starts to become the strongest page. Extrapolate all that goodness out of it. That's, why, English that's, why, that's why I don't believe in, I don't believe, yes. Uh, but that's why I don't believe in um, this whole speed reading thing. You know, it's it's turned into like yeah. a habit, like, you know, speed read, you know, read like the Skim. summary of a book and read like, you know, the front page and the back page and like, you'll know the book, but read like a thousand books. <laughs> it's like, dude, that makes no sense. Like to me, throughout your entire life, you are more better off if you read 10 books that you fully understand than if you read 10,000 books that you don't understand. Do you speak, if, and if you don't mind me asking, do you speak your parents' mother tongue? Yeah, I can speak different okay. languages. Yeah. Do, have you noticed that there's certain things that just make more sense in not English? Um, Not really, to be honest with okay. you. Yeah, I, I mean, culturally, yes. Like, I under, like if we're talking culture, yes. Like, yes. there's some things that don't make sense, you know, in the Western part of the world versus the Eastern part of the world, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, there's different Context. traditions. But no, I wouldn't say, like, reading or book-wise, honestly. I would just say, if you're watching this... Yeah and you think you hate reading, just do me a favor. Find any book and get a dictionary and commit to reading that entire book, but discipline yourself. The minute you go through a word that you don't fully know, definitely, when I say fully know, I have to be able to call on you and you have to be able to tell me five definitions with that word, or sorry, not, not uh, five definitions, but five sentences with that word. Mm -hmm. If you can't say that, you don't understand that word right so do that and if you ever go past a page where you didn't understand it that means you missed a word and if you ever throughout the entire thing start feeling tired yawning dizzy whatever there's something you're missing and you didn't understand do that one thing it might take you a little bit mm -hmm. if you can do that for an entire book and you follow that process you for the first time in your in your life will have actually read something 100 percent and you will learn to love reading and learn what the true definition of learning and reading is. Because a lot of people hate it because they don't understand it. That's what I love about meeting other contrarians. Um, because you and I might have, let's call it what it is, different experiences, yeah. but very similar fucking methods. Yes, for sure. Um, uh, I'm of the belief of listen twice. Yep. Um, I'm of the belief of if you find a book that intrigues you, then e reading is fucking easy. Like mm -hmm. I read a minimum two hours a day. Um, but I like your exercise. I'm actually going to challenge myself to try that. Very um, hard. And, and yeah, many people who are even avid readers don't realize it until they do it. And they're Absolutely. like, holy crap. Like it will blow your mind away. Yeah. Like <laughs> I saw a definition on average. You, you remember 10% of what you read. Oh, a thousand percent. That's why I take notes every <laughs> all the when time. When you trust me. Yeah. When you learn and you go through it and you do the definition thing I'm talking about, for the first time in your life, you're gonna be like, I understand 100% and remember 100% of that book. And then you will realize this whole speed reading, read 10,000 books, blah, 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 read three books a week is BS. It is BS. Because yeah. you, again, like we talked about with impact, net impact, what's the net amount of information you learned? And that's how the way I look at it. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Quality over quantity. And if you're watching this in some things, in some things, really, 
In oh something. shit! I like this disagreement. Okay, in some hit things. me, hit me, hit me. Where are you disagreeing? Quality on? versus quantity is a great topic. I mean, on money is a different story. <laughs> For me, it's quantity to quality, and I'll tell you why. Oh, what does that look like? Especially in business. Okay. You need to reach quantity before you can create create true quality. If I start a company, and I start inventing this product. Mm -hmm like a lot of artists and I want to make the perfect product. There's no flaws. Every little piece of it is perfect. I might think I created the best product in the world, but the marketplace might not think that product market fit. So to me, when I tell everyone, when you're starting a business, stop worrying about oh, creating like this best product. I see what you're saying. Get it out there. Quantity, get hundreds, thousands of customers, yeah. even if the product is not a hundred percent, because that is the only way that you will ever be able to create true quality in your product. So if you're hearing what he's saying, I want you to Google something real quick. It's called an MVP, Mike Victor Papa, minimal viable product. What he's talking about is speed. The growth hacker in me just got really excited when I heard that. Yeah. Uh, basically what you wanna do is, if you have this widget, this thing, it's not gonna be perfect the first time, but the first draft is the perfect draft. You put it out there, you put it in front of a TAM, a total addressable market, and then that total addressable market is going to tell you through their feedback loop, open-ended questions, we'll get into that a little bit, of what they would change. So very, like, let's say we created this rum, and I put this rum in front of people, taste testing, they're gonna tell me, I like this, I don't like this, I'd love this, I'd love that, and then you come back to the drawing board, you make a few changes and you put it back in front of them. And you do that three to four times. This is actually something in our world that we call sprints, design sprints. And if you do this, then you can basically design anything from a tequila to a car company. And you could do it in record time. Um, I, I've got actually, I'm a, I'm a fan of this stuff right here. Uh, we recently did an experiment with Harley Davidson like this because they were trying to get EVs in front of guys like us, yeah. our age brackets. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, look, we have this millions of dollars of research. Dude, it took us four grand and like a week and a half. And we got more done than their and millions of dollars of research yeah. because we just put it in the people's hands. Yep. So, yeah, sorry. I, I, a whole other conversation. Sure. But I, I, I have witnessed what you're talking about. Yeah. And it's in it, it, but it's in anything like, you know, if if I go to the gym mm -hmm. every single day, even if I have the wrong form, I'm not lifting weights the proper way, etc. But I commit to going every single day. And there's this other guy does the perfect form, lifts in the perfect way. You know, everything is like right. But he decides to show up once or twice a week. The guy that comes every day is always going to beat <laughs> that guy that, you know, is perfecting form, trying to go, but is not as consistent. And that is how David believe defeats Goliath. Yeah, it's but it's it's so true. So, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm never going to be someone that's like make a shitty product and don't have quality. But as I'm sure, you know, being in business, like you cannot know if your product is good until you've tested it over and over and over again in the market. Yeah. And people have tried it. And yeah, you're going to have times where you fail and it sucks. Like, you know, it's like building software. My company just rolled out a software. We have to give it to people and we have to expect that there's going to be bugs. There's going to be issues. There's going to be problems. But that is the only way that we're ever going to create the best product. If we sit there all day in invent mode and try to create the best product and wait and wait and wait and wait, at some point, someone will beat us to it. And now this is paralysis, anymore. dude. Yeah. It beats you every time. So just take action. And, you know, sometimes I think I'm at fault with it. Like I take too much action in the sense of like, I don't even think sometimes. Like the I'll Rolls just, Royce makes it different. Yeah. I'll just like <laughs> throw darts, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and hope that one hits. But to me, man, that, that that's all I know. My entire life has not been throwing the dart and hitting it perfectly. My entire life has been I threw 100 darts and like a few of them hit. That's why I resonate with you, man. Like all my life I've heard no. All my life I've heard like fuck off. Let's call it what it is. Um, and there's nowhere to go but up. Like, there's a, they, to certain people, there is this like mountain of possibility when all you hear is no. Yes. And I feel like you, you kind of operate from that perspective as well. Yeah. There's nowhere to go but up. I think you expect no at a certain point. Like, you don't even go in with the expectation of yes. <laughs> oh, you know? yes? It's oh, like, shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, yes, great. You know, but like, no, no, no leads to yes. And so it's you're so just true. constantly getting good news, basically. Yeah, I mean, it's not even good news or bad news. It's just, you know, I'm, I'm not affected or it's it's not emotional for mm -hmm. me at all. Uh, I'm not, when I hear no, I'm not emotionally affected. When I hear yes, I'm not emotionally affected. They're both equal to me. Mm -hmm. And yes, I have wins and I'm happy. 
but it doesn't mean I'm too happy. If I have losses, it doesn't mean I'm sad. I, obviously, I'm not like super happy that I lost, but I'm pretty flat with it because I know I'm going to have wins. I'm going to have losses, and I just have to keep going and creating more wins than losses. What is a space or a type of person you think would benefit the most from practicing that? A space or a type of person that would benefit the most from practicing yeah. anything. Honestly, anything, man. If you play baseball, if you're in e-commerce, if you know you do solar, if you're in real estate, if you do podcasts, every single thing. Yes, there are some people that you know they hopped on and it worked right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. But for every one of those people, there's 99 people that did it and it didn't go anywhere. Keep going, keep attempting, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. I hear this all the time with people like, oh, I'm not comfortable being on camera. I'm not comfortable, you know, I want to do a podcast one day, but like, I'm not ready yet. Or, you know, I'm, I'm worried what people are going to say. And I'm like, that's the biggest problem at the end of the day. You're not willing to take action and go at it. If you suck at podcasting, get on as many podcasts as you can. If you suck at being in front of a camera, film as many videos as you can. When I first got on camera, I absolutely sucked. Today, like, were you I like can, Ricky Bobby? <laughs> today, 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 I can rip videos and I can crush. And people are like, "Dude, how do you one take? Like, how can you do that? How can you do that? Like, off the top?" And it's like, that looks cool to you right now, but you didn't see the thousands of attempts where I was figuring it out. And I think I'm just not scared to to attempt. And I think, in you know, to answer your question, in any space, attempt is the, you know like the only way you're gonna win. Like, you know, the per again, like I said, the person that shows up every single day and tries every single day is the person that wins, not the person that tries to perfect it and shows up here and there. I, I like that because perfectionism, and I've, I've posted this before like a million times, um, perfectionists to me are always interesting because there's this procrastination and fear with a really cool PR spin. Because like, I, so I, it's funny, you're talking about like, travel, like there was this airline that I worked on a few years ago. And long story short, the founder, young perfectionist, and I'd be like, let's go to Winwood, let's do this, let's do that. And he would always tell me the same thing. No, it needs to be perfect, it needs to be perfect, it needs to be perfect. And guess what? I finally got him to agree to one guerrilla campaign. We took models, we put them in very nice garb. We basically designed their stewardess outfits and we went to MIA and we went to Fort Lauderdale. We took a red carpet. We took some like a chocolates. private company, like one of those local. We flights? so we acquired a, a we acquired a small private jet fleet okay. uh, based out of Columbus, Ohio, and then we retrofitted a few of them with uh, uh, designers. And then the idea was to take that over to Art Miami. We took it to the airports. We put it in front of people. We started basically showing them a good time. And it's funny because he hated the fucking idea. He said, "No, it's not going to work." Then I took him to Winwood. And then I rolled out the red carpet. Literally, like, if you were walking, I threw out the red carpet. Yeah. And I'd be like, hey, if you could design your own airline, what would it be like? And we took that feedback and we took it back to Yasava, the, the, the designers. Dude, we won an award in Switzerland. Wow. And he, after a while, he was like, his name is Xander. Much love to you, Xander. Xander turns around and is like, oh, fuck. You were right. Yeah, dude, he was like, I don't know. Okay, you were right. And then we raised capital out in Dubai because of that. And the whole idea of that is like, you know what? I was wrong. You're right. You said it's the quantity and quality. They're more connected. It's not basically they're not mutually exclusive. And guess what? They're one and the same because I just realized, fuck, I was wrong, dude. And guess what? You could have had that idea and it didn't work and it was still the right move. Yeah. I'm glad it worked. <laughs> I'm so I, glad I, know, it worked. I, I know you're glad it worked, but you could have had that idea. And so the people that win are the people that are willing to have that idea be wrong nine times. And then on time number 10. Oh, I told him I'd quit. I was like, if, if this doesn't work, I'm done. I wish you well. But, yeah. Uh, and he's like, okay, I'll take you up on the bed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like for me, it's just I've always been like that. It's almost like a hammer. Like, like I picture like literally a hammer just going at it. It's like, dude, I've had so many things that haven't worked. It's just because i'm willing to hit but the you're hammer okay with that over and over and over and over again and i'm not emotionally affected by it. like it's literally flat for me like i'm not like you tell me no it's flat like I, you're so not i got that me. from growing up in brooklyn and the army where did you get that from um my whole life just adversity getting told no a bunch failing a bunch to a point where it's like you fail so much that you expect failure um and then actually when i first started winning in my life as i got older and made a little bit more money I got really excited, like super excited. And I learned the other side of it, oh. which was 
you win a lot and that gets to your head and you get excited that the next time you lose that emotion kicks back in because you're used to winning you take that personally so for me now when i win i'm not like crazy excited like it's it's an expectation it's a part of it it's probability it's, a, it's like step listen, in the process. It's, like, it's like i know dude like if i win 70 percent of the time and i lose 30 percent of the time it's an equation every time i lose it was a part of the formula every time i win it was a part of the formula and i'm flat with it so as we're wrapping things up i want to take a moment to go over a few things specifically the finer points watching recording taking notes you want to rewind we started off the conversation with the topic the dyers of a contrarian now contrarians iconoclasts anti-heroes whatever you want to call it they all have the same exact thing in common i'm a little biased when i say this while everyone is zigging we're kind of forced to zag and something that i i definitely give you my props for is that zane is used to hearing no and something happens when you're used to hearing no you stop giving a fuck <laughs> and when you stop giving a fuck hearing no just becomes normal and after you start hearing no and it becomes normal guess what happens you kind of become desensitized to it he started going into how he grew up in a certain way with a certain environment and between hearing no from home and no from school and no from work he kind of looked at it like okay well yes self-deprecation i can go to self-sabotage blah, blah, blah. he then instead focused on up upward mobility and another point that he gets into right after that was he starts to look at his surroundings he looked at his network his network included a person that was in solar so since he's the guy that's used to hearing no he then looks at the guy doing solar doing well for themselves and said well let me see what i can contribute to that because i'm used to hearing no he then moves cross country to california and starts knocking on doors and I mean, I personally got excited and I hope that you take this away from it. When you're used to hearing no and you go to a place where no one knows you, uh, if you're medium ugly, you might understand this analogy. There's no way to lose by approaching a person for a conversation because the worst case scenario is what you're used to. The best case scenario is, oh shit, step two. Which brings me to the other part of his lessons, the nuggets he's dropping here is he then proceeds to go into this is what I want. These are the steps to get there. So I'm going to work backwards. As he starts to dissect that, he starts to realize the yes and the no, it's a numbers game. The more numbers I get, the more yeses I get. Those are the ones that matter, which then gets into the whole something that I was very wrong about. I used to say quality over quantity. He says they're not mutually exclusive. In fact, they're actually correlated. He starts to play the numbers game, which leads into the quality because he starts to focus on the idea of his perspective, which is the more numbers I bring in, the more I get to extract from that and to play with. So, for example, in this scenario, if I'm making more money, I get to contribute to my family, my friends, my environment, my clients, my customers. Which then brings us to the part that we're at now, which is I'm winning. Now what? What do I focus on? What do I choose to lend my energy and my expertise to? Am I kind of getting exactly understanding what you're right. putting down? Nailing it on the head, yeah. 100%. I want to make sure that I'm understanding. You know? I don't want to leave nothing to change Perfect. here. Perfect. Um, so as, as we're wrapping up, obviously, I, I love having you here. For it's sure. been fucking Thank awesome you. getting to know you, man. Um, but let me throw you, let me throw the floor to you specifically for this one thing. In the last 12 months, what is something that you've either done or been a part of that you are just insurmountably proud of? Insurmountably proud of. Um, you know, there's no one thing. I would just say overall, it's the journey of scaling my business. And the reason that I select that thing, which, you know, might even be obvious to some people, but is we have grown in such a fast rate and been able to hire so many people and create so much opportunity jobs and help so many customers um, pay out so many commissions to salespeople um, change families, change lives. You know, I know people that have, you know, bought cars for their mom and dad, bought houses for their mom and dad, nice. paid off their sister's college, like done stuff that's true impact in their personal lives. And, you know, to me at this point, that is the thing that I'm good at. That is what I can contribute and do. You know, I'm not an athlete where I go and I play and I give people entertainment. I'm not a comedian where I get up on stage and people think I'm funny. I am someone, you know, God or, has 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 given me this skill set i've had this ability 
and my life has gone down this path to where this is what I've become really good at. <laughs> and um, over the last 12 months, we've helped a crap ton of people. But in reality, what I'm really proud of is throughout that entire process, never wavering on who I am and my belief and my process and my ethics and my standards for myself and knowing that we are just 1% of the way there. We're gonna keep doing this for a very long time and we're gonna help way more than what we've done. And like, we're, we're, we're at a very small place. We're like a baby right now. You've, I mean, obviously we talked in length about a few things, but the whole concept of selling out, how do you combat selling out? Uh, I don't even know what selling out is to be completely honest with you, man, because you know, to me selling out really is, is doing something that you don't really have any passion for or don't mm -hmm. really believe in. And to me, it's not even like, like I can't sell out because I can't even be successful at something I don't believe in. Mm -hmm. Like I, I've tried. I get very awkward, very weird Trust about it. My communication yeah. drops. I can't respond to people. Like I, I've tried, I'm telling you with this one guy, I tried doing something that wasn't me. Mm. And I'm very lucky to have that opportunity, you know, a few years back because it showed me how bad I am at doing something that I'm not all in on. Lesson learned. I'm like very bad at it. Like maybe some people are good at it. Yeah. I'm very bad at it. Like I'm horrible at it. And as we wrap up, I gotta ask, let's give somebody their flowers. Who is someone that we might have overlooked or you feel we don't appreciate enough that you've learned a valuable, valuable lesson from? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I would say probably like the biggest influence in my life. Uh, and I know it's gonna sound like Go for it. super cliche, um, but it's my parents, you know, cause I've talked a lot on this podcast about how you know, I didn't learn a lot and, you know, they had this fear mentality and this and that. But the one thing that they were really good at teaching me was being nice to people and, um, you know, caring for people and always being selfless and putting other people first to take care of them. I just witnessed my parents, you know, miss out on so many things to help others mm -hmm. or even when they didn't have a lot of money, give back to people and donate stuff. And to me, that one thing mm -hmm. is the reason I'm so successful because that is what's created this abundant mentality for me. Like when I, when I get something, I'm more than happy giving it and creating and putting it out there and not just holding on to it simply because I watch them not make a lot of money. And, you know, obviously they still have the fear mentality and saving and all this stuff, but I witness them be so nice and caring for people. And even, you know, I've witnessed them being taken advantage of a lot of times. So That's for hard. me, it's like when I saw that, I'm like, they're just the nicest people in the world. And they gave me this characteristic of caring about other people. And even if someone takes advantage of me, I'm willing to take the shot and try to help someone out even when they have taken advantage of me. Um, and that skill set, I believe, is the thing that pays me the most dividends because it's, you know, I, I give, give, give. And, you know, sometimes I receive and um, I win. And uh, it's because I've decided to help and give and take selfless actions. And that's who I learned it from at the end of the day. Like I, like I think if I grew up in a very selfish family, like my makeup and my life would have been different. Mm. That resonates like a motherfucker. Um, so <laughs> as we wrap up, um, obviously we went through some summary, some summary items in li line items. Uh, but specifically, uh, I'd like to end on a, sp a note that I hope you take away from Zane's experience. Um, and yes, taking risks, it sounds sexy in theory, but in practice, a lot of people stop themselves. And I understand why. Um, but if you're hearing this, watching this, and life has just been an absolute asshole to you, consider something. What if it works out? Um, you know, he, he just touched on something where he's like, look, I watch my parents get screwed over, but they just give, 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 give. And there's something in there, a nugget, a nugget that I hope that, at least for me, is, it's resonating from personal experience anecdotally. And maybe you can challenge yourself to have fun with this, is that life really is really cool when you seek to understand first more than be understood. So Zane's parents seek to understand their neighbor. Zane seeks to understand industry, people, 
and neighbor. And that is why he's prioritizing less being understood and he's being rewarded the way he is being rewarded. I want to give a huge thanks to Hands Free Automation and Vegan Gummies for supporting uh, Active Minds now on the rocks. I want to thank Zane very much for his risk taking and his approach on life. And I want to thank you so much for tuning in, giving this a shot. Um, we're going to sign off on a different note today because we're trying something different. And real quick, I'd love though, for you before to, to close this out. Before, yeah, before you end off, a huge shout out to you because you know I've been in a lot of podcasts, a lot of interviews, and it's not easy to be the person asking questions. It's not easy to be the person interviewing. Um, and you've done a great job making me feel good, making me, you know, ask, uh, you, you've asked me really good questions that have helped me give good answers and you've been a great host. So I just want to thank you for that. Dude. Cheers, man. Cheers, brother. And if thank you're, you uh, and whatever, and whatever you're going through in life right now, whatever you're a part of, whatever your goal is, just don't give up, keep going. And number one piece of advice is, uh, never quit ever. I don't know how to do that ever. I'm such a moron. I don't know yeah. how to. <laughs> e even if it means like you're 70 years old and you're still figuring it out, never quit. Fuck yeah. This has been Catriel C. Sarfati. This has been Zane. This has been Active Minds Podcast, where we seek to have conversations with people like Zane, explore life through their perspective, their lens, their experiences, have a little fun figuring out how it actually connects to us, and most importantly, moving smarter together. Have a good night. So guys, as we're wrapping up, we want to remind you that we have our membership program now available on ActiveMindsClub.com. ActiveMindsClub.com. Grab yourself a seat. See you there.